Hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and donors and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their health care providers. The PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, please feel free to type in your questions, but uh, remember that we'll save them till the end. We've allotted as much time as possible to uh, give us time to answer all your questions. Today's webinar, Approach to the Patient Undergoing Pituitary Surgery, is being presented by Dr. Lawrence Katznelson and Dr. Juan Fernandez Miranda. Dr. Katznelson is a neuroendocrinologist at the Stanford University Medical Center. He is also a professor of neurosurgery and of medicine. Dr. Katznelson received his medical degree from the University of California, Los Angeles, and performed his internship and residency in internal medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. He then performed a fellowship in endocrinology and metabolism at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Dr. Katznelson is a professor of neurosurgery and medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. At Stanford University, he is the Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education and the Chair of the GME Committee. Dr. Katznelson is the Medical Director of the Pituitary Center at Stanford Hospital and Clinics. In the Endocrine Society, Dr. Katznelson has served as Chair of the Special Programs Committee and Nominations Committees. He has served as Chair of the Task Forces for Writing Clinical Guidelines for the Approach to Acromegaly for both the Endocrine Society and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and Chair Pituitary Committee for the American Association of Clin Clinical Endocrinologists. In endocrinology, Dr. Katznelson has a long-standing clinical and research interest in the pathophysiology and treatment of pituitary disease. Dr. Fernandez Miranda is a professor of neurosurgery and surgical director of the Stanford Brain Tumor Skull Base and Pituitary Centers. He completed his neurosurgery residency at La Paz University Hospital in Madrid, Spain. He underwent fellowship training in microsurgical neuroanatomy at the University of Florida. He continued subspecialty clinical training in cerebrovascular neuroanatomy, sorry, cerebrovascular surgery at the University of Virginia and endoscopic endonasal and open skull based surgery at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. During his 10-year tenure at UPMC, he pioneered endoscopic endonasal approaches to highly complex pituitary and skull based tumors, developed a world-class complex brain surgery program, and led a premier training and research program on surgical neuroanatomy and skull based surgery. Dr. Fernandez Miranda is internationally renowned for his expertise in minimally invasive brain surgery, endoscopic skull base and pituitary surgery, open skull base surgery, and complex brain tumor surgery. He has performed over a thousand endoscopic endonasal operations for pituitary tumors and other skull base lesions. Doctor, thank you both so much for your involvement with the pituitary or the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program. There's going to be a brief delay as we change presenters and you should see on your end to accept. I can see your screen now. I cannot hear you. Okay, do you, um, do you hear us now? Yes, yes. Okay, let's get started. Thank you so All much right. for that introduction. I am Larry Katznelson. Oh, I'm Larry Katznelson. I'm the medical director of our pituitary program, and I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Juan Fernandez Miranda, who is the surgical director, and we are very happy to spend today with you. Our topic will be the approach to the pain going pituitary surgery, and in this next uh, hour, 
we will review with you our, our approach to a patient who is going to have surgery, the surgical opportunities available and outcomes, and really how the patient is managed uh, when they are planning to undergo and then they do undergo pituitary surgery. Um, let's see, change slides. Uh, Uh, we are here at Stanford. Here's our photographs. Uh, in the background on the slide is our new hospital, which will be in about a, a year, almost exactly a year. Um, I'm showing you here an example of a pituitary MRI. On the right side, you see what is called a sagittal cut. That means it's the brain on the on from the side, and right in the middle is where the plan sits. There's also, to the left, is a cadaver uh, as an example of what the pituitary gland looks like. And, uh, oops, uh, okay, there we go. And right here is the pituitary gland on the MRI scan. If you see this sitting right on top of this black air, black means air, this is the sphenoid sinus, and as you'll hear. Dr. Katznelson? The slides seem to be a little yes. behind. For me, I'm seeing the picture of uh, the university hospital with your images below that. I don't know if everyone else is seeing the same thing I am, but it seems to be a little uh, delayed. Yeah, I'm not sure how we can, because that's not what I'm looking at. Okay. Can you help me in how we can change that? Um, let me see if I can. Give me just a minute. Let me see if I can. That was one second ago for our concern. Can anybody else let me know if you see what he sees or what I see? It might be my connection that's slow. Okay, so another person sees what I see. I see mountains right now. <laughs> Do you all see mountains or? Okay, normal pituitary MRI. Okay, so now I see the pituitary MRI also. So, it so looks can like you it's help us up. on and when we advance screens? Okay. Uh, okay, let me start with the slide and as, and as we get going, you could help us so that we can make sure this works correctly. Yeah. Starting on the slide on the right side here, and I hope everybody knows this, are, should be two pictures. Uh, kind of the one on the left of this, the one on the right is an MRI scan, and it's showing the pituitary gland on a side view of the brain called sagittal cut. And, I have a, and right in the middle uh, is the pituitary gland over the black area, which is air. That's an air pocket or sinus. That's the sphenoid sinus. And on the left of this image is a picture from a cadaver showing basically the same anatomy, but now filled with blood vessels and brain itself. And you can see where the pituitary gland sits. It sits right behind the nose, and as you will hear more from my colleague about where how the surgery is, addresses this by going right through the nose, to the back of the nose, to where the pituitary gland sits. Here uh, you should see a different, M now you'll see an MRI from the front. Uh, now on the left side you see an MRI where the pituitary gland is what's lighting up with the contrast right in the middle. I hope everybody's seeing this. Uh, and uh, there's a stalk which connects the pituitary gland to the base of the brain. That's full of blood vessels and nerves that bring important growth factors down to the pituitary. So the pituitary gland sits right under the, right in the middle of the skull. I'm showing you now what's titled a normal pituitary MRI. And what we see is what a tumor looks like of the pituitary gland. These tumors go both upwards into what are the eye nerves, uh, pushing the eye nerves uh, called the optic chiasm. When this happens, people can lose this visual function. These tumors can also grow to the side, as does the picture on the right, where the tumor is now surrounding that black hole. That black hole is the is the carotid artery, 
And so when the, when the tumor surrounds that, the white mass is surrounding it, that means the tumor has extended out to the side in what's called the cavernous sinus. And this part of the tumor can be in a situation where the, the surgeon cannot reach it. And you're gonna be hearing more about that. The part the surgeon can reach easily is that which is right in the middle of the scan, which extends upwards. The slide now is a picture of the pituitary gland and with the different hormones that are produced by the pituitary. Uh, the, starting from the left, the gonadotropins FSH and LH control ovaries in women and testicle function in men. So it controls uh, sperm and eggs as well as hormone and male hormone, estrogen and testosterone. Growth hormone uh, produced by the pituitary gland is essential for longitudinal bone growth. It's very important in children as they grow uh, to reach normal height, and also important in adults, not only in maintaining bone mass, but also in maintaining quality of life and thinking ability, as well as muscle and fat composition. Prolactin controls and milk production for pregnancy. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, is critical for controlling adrenal gland function, adrenal glands, cortisol. So if you don't make ACTH, you cannot make cortisol, and we have to replace that, or otherwise there's a problem called adrenal insufficiency. TSH, thyroid stimulating, stimulating hormone, controls the thyroid gland, so the thyroid gland can produce its hormones, uh, thyroxin, the main one. Oxytocin is a hormone controlled by the back of the pituitary gland, the posterior gland, which is essential for normal delivery. as part of the, the process of a woman undergoing labor and delivery. And the other uh, pituitary hormone uh, is antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, which is essential for controlling water and electrolytes by the kidney. And we're going to be discussing that a little bit more, this hormone, when we discuss the palliative care of a patient with pituitary surgery. You should now see a slide that's, that's entitled Pituitary Tumor Types. The tumors are, are, are growths of the pituitary gland that come from different cell types. So depending on which cell type of the pituitary gland is becoming a tumor will dictate what that person's clinical characteristics will be. For example, if the hormone of the cells that make hormone the hormone prolactin grow, that becomes a noma and levels of prolactin become high. Uh, similarly, a patient who makes too much growth hormone has called acromegaly. That is issue with a tumor making growth hormone with excessive growth of all parts of the body. A tumor that comes from ACTH cells is Cushing's disease, and patients who have Cushing's disease are, become blown up with excessive steroid levels, and that can cause a whole syndrome in itself. We'll discuss a little bit about that later. Most of the pituitary tumors are what we call non-functioning, meaning that the person looks normal, but a growth was found in the workup for something else, such as headaches or loss of vision, or feeling fatigued, and a brain MRI is done, and a tumor is found. These are the most common incidentally found tumors, and for all practical purposes, one of the most common types of pituitary diseases we see. Now, acromegaly, Cushing's, and palactinoma, expert within themselves, we will not be discussing the diagnosis of these today, or for that matter, different modalities that we can use to treat. They'll be the subject of other uh, discourses uh, through the PNA. But right now, we're going to be discussing the approach to these patients when they undergo surgery. So when we think about, from a physician's standpoint, how we approach a patient who will have surgery, who's got a pituitary tumor, we think about the different hormones and how they can impact people. So I, as a medical endocrinologist, when I'm seeing a patient before surgery, one of the thoughts I have is, are there low levels of hormones? What do we see in terms of functioning of the pituitary gland at this time? Because that may dictate how I'm going to manage this patient when they undergo surgery. So just to review different systems again, adrenal gland cortisol. So if I am going to assess cortisol levels, what I will do in my office before surgery is measure a cortisol. You can measure a morning cortisol, and there is a rhythm to cortisol. So a morning cortisol can tell you if the the person has a function that is normal or not. A level less than five is quite low. A level less than 12 is considered adequate. Something in between five and 
12 is judgment call based on how the person's doing. There may also be a crotrosis stimulation test, which is a test, another test of adrenal function using a medication called crotrosin, and we look for cortisol levels action. For the thyroid gland, we measure the thyroid test. That includes a free T4, that's the thyroid hormone cell, and TSH, which is the pituitary hormone we discussed before, and we look for low, low levels of those hormones. For gonadal function, a woman who's of menstrual age, we ask if the woman's menstruating, if there is normal estrogen function by the ovary, and in men, we measure a testosterone to determine if the level's normal or low. Growth hormone is assessed, for the most part, by what's called insulin-like growth factor one, that's an IGF-1 level, that's a screening test for the growth hormone levels. And we use it quite a bit to test and some form of guesstimate of what the growth hormone result is. If the levels are low, that suggests the patient has growth hormone deficiency. If high, that could suggest acromegaly. And diuretic hormone is a hormone when low can cause what's called diabetes insipidus. That means because antidiuretic hormone controls our fluid choice. When it's low, we, it's a lot of urination, a lot of thirst, like sugar diabetes, but it's not due to sugar. It's due to the fact that this hormone level is low. So the preoperative assessment and then management is shown on the slide. What my, my management has been is a recommenda recommendation to uh, a neurosurgeon is for the patient is found beforehand to have low pituitary function and particularly adrenal insufficiency. We administer, we administer steroids at the time of surgery using, for the most part, hydrocortisone at doses of grams every 8 to 12 hours during and then following surgery. And then we lower the, the, the dose, it's called a taper, after surgery to lowish doses, and then we reassess postoperatively. If the patient has found hypothyroidism preoperatively, we replace the thyroxine if the surgery does not have to be done imminently, if there's urgency, such as significant loss of visual function. Otherwise, unless the patient has severe hypothyroidism, we do not hold on the surgery, go ahead with surgery, and then we assess the thyroid function after surgery. Now comes the time for surgery. I'm going to pass uh, the baton to my colleague, Dr. Fernandez Miranda, who will speak at this point about the approach to surgery, and then I'll come back later on, discuss how we manage the patients postoperatively from the endocrinology service line. Dr. Fernandez Miranda. So, uh, trying to uh, give this presentation, uh, you know, I uh, I must say that it's uh, it is it's for me a real honor to be part of the Stanford uh, Pituitary Center, and uh, uh, it, it was this was actually one of the reasons I decided to move to Stanford University to work with uh, Dr. Kat Nelson, uh, as he is working on endocrinologist, and I also wanted to have the importance of. Uh, or uh, because a lot of the operations we do, or all of the operations we do is with them, and a lot of the care that patients need is with, with uh, rhinology also, So and they're also uh, world-class uh, surgeons. So um, one of the things that are very special here is that we work in a coordinated fashion, and uh, that is very important for me and very important for our patients, meaning uh, when we have a new patient, we see them together in our clinic at the same day, at the same time, so we can make recommendations right there on what is the best medical and possible surgical treatment for the patient. And I think this provides coordination of care under the same roof, which uh, makes it easier for patients and, and more effective for all of us. Now, the uh, endoscopic and the nasal approach, or preferred approach for pituitary tumors, and uh, this approach, as you probably know, has been around for over two decades now, but especially over the last decade, it has really expanded into other areas of the skull base. And this has become almost a super specialty in the field that I've been privileged to work on for, uh, you know, over the last day uh, in trying to understand better these approaches, the anatomy that is required and applying to different pathologies, among them most commonly for pituitary tumors. For this approach, we use uh, the endoscope, of course, which is the visualization tool. It's a billion years in diameter, so it fits very well to the nostrils. And then it provides this wide-angle view. And you can see here some pictures 
of dissections in, in anatomical specimens, it, but it provides a very wide angle view. And that is the distinction, the key feature of the endoscope. You compare the microscope with the end, uh, uh, the, view, the microscope is approximately what you see here, while this yellow circle within it. So if you see the crude arteries, which are on the sides are outside of the yellow circle, you cannot see them very well. The cavernous sinus is this, you cannot see it very well. While you use the endoscope, you can see all these areas. You can actually see the whole picture, uh, uh, as you see here. And this is more efficient, uh, more accurate, and it's safer for the patient. As we said, this is, an, this is a team approach. In, and uh, teamwork is very important in everything we do. And in surgery, is key. We work with our rhinology team. They are phenomenal surgeons working through the nose. And this is, again, very important because the main let's say, of the operation, and the main complaint that patients have after an operation for pituitary surgery are related to nasal healing. And having very good rhinologies makes a very important difference in the outcome and the comfort of patients after the operation. And, uh, we can do now very large tumors with the endoscope. This is a very large pituitary tumor that you hear that in the past, just a few years ago, in fact, in, Many centers across the country, this will not be done through an endonasal approach because it's too complex, but we can actually manage tumors like this to do all of them through an endonasal approach. And this is, in my opinion, better than doing a craniotomy, a transcranial approach, because it's less if it's more effective and it's safer for patients. We have to use special instruments for these operations, and uh, we designed some of those, and these are, you know, pistol grip, as we call them, a type of scissors, and these are very fine instruments. We design also this type of dissectors that can be in it so we can reach deeper in areas of the pituitary and beyond. And uh, a question I'm asked, and I'm, st I'm still very surprised when I am asked this question because it's something that is so obvious to me, is can you say the pituitary gland? And yes, of course, we can say the pituitary gland. We, I would say almost nearly always we can say the pituitary gland. We can see it very well with the endoscope is one of the also benefits of the endoscopes, you can differentiate normal tissue of the pituitary versus uh, tumor tissue very well. And uh, I always try to use the so-called extra capsular dissection technique, which simply means you try to identify the plane between the tumor and the pituitary gland, because you preserve that pituitary gland so the patient retains its. So uh, you can see here an example of a large pituitary tissue Embedded in the cavernous side, this area on the side, and you cannot see the pituitary gland in this picture. If you're experienced looking at this, you know that it's pushed to this side because there's more white in the MRI because it takes more contact. But then you see that after the operation, the pituitary gland is now back into its position and uh, it looks almost normal with the exception of this right side. It's probably where the tumor was originating from. So when you have a pituitary tumor, the larger it is, the more damage it causes to the pituitary gland and this is probably where it was coming from but the other side of the pituitary looks very good and this patient of course has normal pituitary function after the end even a case as large as the one i just saw you before this one here if the patient has an intact function before the operation it's actually still very likely that we'll keep the function intact after the operation you can see after the operation we can see the pituitary stock and we can see the pituitary gland in this case is much smaller, it's pushed to one side, to the left side here, but still there is a pituitary gland which we could not find in the previous, in the pre operative imaging. And you can see here uh, in more detail the pituitary gland preserved here and the pituitary stock. So I tell my patients when I meet them before an operation um, about the chances of complications and the risk for complications, let's say. And this these are based on a large publication we, we did, you know, a good number of years ago, and also based on all my ex personal experience later on. So, in general, the rate of a new pituitary deficit is below 5%. All the experience later has been below 1%. The rate of permanent diabetes in CPD that was 2% is even lower now, so very low. Patients can get some transient diabetes in CPD more commonly, perhaps 10, 15%, but permanent is actually very uh, unusual. And some patients get better, but they get a hormonal improvement. It's not very often. Um, I always tell patients that we are actually very good at preserving the function of the pituitary gland, 
but we are not that good at recovering the function of the pituitary gland. Once it's lost, uh, you know, we sometimes can make it better, but, but uh, not as often as we would like to. In terms of uh, visual outcome, patients, uh, the vast majority get better uh, vision after the operation. It, they, it either goes back to normal as it was or improves uh, to some extent. And uh, there is just a few that remain the same, and it's very rare that patients get worse in vision after the operation. When this happens, and in our experience in the past, uh, mainly was because of complications. Like there's a hemorrhage, uh, basically, during uh, in the 24 hours after the operation, and that hemorrhage compresses the optic apparatus, and then you can have visual loss from that. And I said it's transient because go back, remove the clot, and make the vision uh, recover uh, as it was before the operation. So worsening vision after the operation is actually very unusual. CSF leak rate is perhaps the most common complication of the operations we do. It used to be about 5% when we were learning these techniques in the past. Now it's about 2%. And uh, it, it, we have a number of uh, reconstruction techniques that we use depending on the type of skull-based defect. You can do an operation where you have if you are careful enough and the tumor is not too large, you can operate without noise panel leakage during the operation. Therefore, the risk of leakage afterwards is virtually zero. But if you have a larger defect, then you need to act. And we have usually with tissue we borrow from inside the nose. The most devastating uh, injury you can have in pituitary surgery is an, uh, is an injury to the carotid artery. And, uh, all, all of us as pituitary surgeons, we always fear this complication, and uh, we fear it because there is a risk of a stroke when this happens. But actually, this the, the incidence of injury to the carotid artery decreases dramatically with experience of, of the surgeon. I, I'm being very fortunate not to have any injuries over the, in my, ex, my experience of over a thousand cases, um, but I know that this uh, can happen. It's a risk that could happen. So I always tell my patients this: there is about 0.1% of having a carotid injury. And uh, this is, uh, again, based on uh, surgical experience uh, uh, greatly. Now, another important factor when we look at pituitary tumors is the not only the size, but also the fact of whether the tumor is in the cavern of sinus or not. The cavern of sinus are venous cavities that are on each side of the pituitary gland. And inside these cavernous sinuses, we have the carotid artery, and then we have the nerves going to the eye to move the eye. When the tumor invades into this cavity, it makes things more complicated. And we studied this, and you see in blue here is the number of grossal resections here, and you see how it decreases as we get into the uh, uh, patterns of cavernous sinus invasion. Now, we've, made, we've been making progress over the years, and the numbers have uh, significantly improved. So now what is called NOSP3, which is a classification we use, we can remove the vast majority, about 80% of these tumors. When it's NOSP4, we still are very limited, and probably only a quarter of these tumors can be completely removed these days. Now, I, I was very interested in studying myself this, the anatomy of the cavernous sinus and how to do better operations and better resections, safer and more effective. And I have these compartments of the cavernous sinus. This is based on the understanding of the anatomy of the cavernous sinus from an endoscopic endonasal approach. This has uh, helped me and help others to do better operations in the cavernous sinus. This is an example of a tumor that is large and invading the cavernous sinus, and we're looking above the carotid. This here is the carotid artery right here. We're working above it in this, what we call the superior compartment, and that gray tissue you see we're aspirating, that's the tumor there. And uh, we're using an angular scope. We have nicely exposed the carotid artery by removing the bone that covers it. We are gently uh, displacing the And uh, this is a very safe way of working into the cavern of sinus. Also, we are, now, we are in an area where the cranial nerves are relatively protected. So the risks of doing this are actually very low. And you can see here, after the operation, how there is a complete resection of this of this tumor, and the patient has intact uh, eye function, intact pituitary function. We've also recently described how to remove tumors that are even more extensive, that they grow beyond the cavernous sinus. 
and you can see in this cartoon here, tumors that from the pituitary just grow out to the side. And uh, like it happens in this tumor. In the past, these tumors required one transcranial operation, operation or two operations, one in the nasal and open transcranial to remove the tumor that is uh, uh, superior and lateral because it was not reachable. But I've now learned how to remove these tumors on one single stage. So patients don't only have to go through one operation to remove the uh, majority of the, of the tumor. And something that uh, actually we just published and is actually very important for, for work in the pituitary is the description and better understanding of the wall of the cavern of sinus. What the wall that separates the pituitary gland that you can see here or here in the cartoon separates the pituitary gland from the choroid artery in the cavern of sinus. And there are ligaments that attach to this wall right here. You see, as, as a surgeon, to me, the structure of the anatomy, which is the structure of the pituitary and surrounding structures, is, is extremely important understanding that very well, because it's what uh, makes me uh, able to remove tumors from this area safely. And we studied these ligaments, and these ligaments are actually uh, not well known. They were not well known. We, uh, we studied carefully, and we described a number of them and the arteries you can encounter in your uh, way um, into the cavernous sinus. And this was designed as a way to safely remove the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. Now, why is this important? This is actually very difficult and very few surgeons in, in, in the world actually have described or have even attempted to do this safely. Why is this important? Because there are tumors, especially functional tumors, that invade into this, into this middle wall of the cavernous sinus. And if you don't remove it, uh, the chances for remission, let's say in Cushing's disease, for example, or acromegaly, are going to be much smaller, or the chances of recurrence are going to be much higher. So this, uh, we did in, in 50 cases total, 34 of them were functional tumors, and all of them except one got complete biochemical remission. And we did this with no deaths, no, no ICA injuries, uh, with only two patients actually required transfusion, and the main downside is there were four patients, and these were most of them at the beginning of, of my experience doing this, develop a transient cranial nerve palsy, meaning transient double vision, because uh, the material we, we put to pack the cavernous sinus compressed that cranial nerve, but all of them recover in a period of, a, of uh, three months. So uh, in my opinion, that's actually worthy if you're gonna be getting a remission, a complete removal of uh, the tumor. This is an example of a, an operation, and uh, this is a tumor in a patient with uh, Cushing's disease. And uh, you can see the tumor in the MRI, and this is the pituitary gland right here. And this is the wall of the cavernous sinus in blue. This is the coronary artery exposed here. I like to do this wide exposure because it, 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 uh, it is better. And then I can see the pituitary gland in this side versus the tumor on this side. I just surround the tumor completely and remove it in, mostly in one single piece. And then this here is the wall of the cavernous sinus with the choroid on the other side. So I'm using a cottonoid to protect the arachnoid so we don't get a single of leak. And then I'm removing this tumor, and this tumor has an attachment to this wall of the cavernous sinus. Now, in the past, we would just, I would have just burned this area with a bipolar, with a cautery. But now that I understand this anatomy, uh, I feel that I can do this very safely and I can open now the anterior wall, the cavernous sinus. Oops. And then by opening, excuse me, that wall here, I can now cut the medial wall, separate it from the floor of the pituitary, and now dissect this membrane completely off the carotid wall. And then we send this membrane that we cut to the pathology often they find that there is tumor, microscopic disease, do that. So we hadn't take this uh, membrane, the patient would not be in remission likely after the operation. That is the carotid artery, and this is us removing completely the membrane that has been invaded by tumor. And at the end of the operation, you can see this is the diaphragm, this is the pituitary gland, that is the carotid, and this is the reconstruction with a mucosal graft. I've done this even on both sides, and a patient like this that had severe Cushing's disease, uh, I removed the wall of the cavernous sinus on both sides, 
and the patient amazingly still in remission, complete remission five years after the operation. And this happens, these are some of my patients with permission, I, I put their pictures, but this, for example, patient with acromegaly had an operation somewhere else and they left the middle wall of the cavern of sinus, the tumor grew from there again. So then I went back and I removed the remaining of the tumor completely and this patient to this day is also in remission of uh, acromegaly. And also, we very rarely operate on prolactinomas, but I just want to put an example because although all in the mass majority of patients we recommend medical treatment, there are a few exceptions, and one of them is a patient like this that presents with severe progressive visual decline that happens rapidly. This patient is losing vision uh, day by day, and it happens that this patient has a large cyst that is developing, and when the patient ha when patients has tumor with cyst, prolactinomas with cystic changes, if they compress the optic apparatus, the vision can deteriorate rapidly, and medication can take a while to make effect. So in those cases, we might prefer to do an operation. And this patient, that's exactly what I did, and actually it was in remission after the operation with no need for medical treatment. And complete or near complete visual recovery very far, very quickly after the operation. And uh, I just want to assert with you to finish that we sometimes do uh, other cases that are more complex, like cranial pharyngiomas in this area. This actually video is not, uh, not running, but uh, that is okay. In, it, it just shows that it's important as pituitary surgeons to also be a skull-based surgeons because it allows you to um, take a step forward. And if you're dealing with very complex pituitary tumor, you can actually manage it and deal with them. So one of the recommendations after uh, the operation, management that we do after the operation. Most patients do not get a lumbar drain. Nowadays, we do not need a lumbar drain for this patient, neither in trap nor after the operation. There is no need for nasal packing anymore. What there is, our rhinology group are now using, is now using internal absorbable packing that uh, you know, dissolves in, uh, spontaneously and it's much more comfortable for our patients. Hospital stay varies from one to two days, rarely three days, perhaps in older patients, but about one or two days. And then we have a post-operative visit, seven to 10 days, uh, that we try to call coordinate together with ENT, endocrinology, um, and neurosurgery. Some of the restrictions, as the, the patients can now blow their nose, uh, we ask them to avoid heavy lifting or do, uh, doing strenuous activities. They can do light activities. They can, you know, just, uh, slowly regain their activities, but they should avoid uh, overdoing it for the first two weeks. And that way we recommend being out of work for two weeks and then slowly start light activities over the next two weeks uh, to regain normal activities week four to six after the operation. Traveling from Maui, so from international uh, destinations, they will, uh, we would recommend the traveling back to their countries seven or 10, 14 days after the operation. This will be ten, depend on our concern of the risk of a post-operative CSA in the operation. They can usually go back within a week of the operation. If there was a leak that we would like them to wait about two weeks after they go back to their, to their home. And uh, with this, uh, I finish this portion of the, uh, of my uh, presentation in terms of uh, surgery and details for, uh, operations. I just want to reiterate that it's, it's a, a pleasure and an honor to work with uh, Dr. Kat Nelson and uh, it is his turn now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez Miranda. And may I say that I want to support what he just said. It is a team approach and I am fortunate to have a gifted neurosurgery colleague, Dr. Fernandez Miranda, to do his part of the, of the work as part of the team with me. So I'm just, it's a joy to work with him. I'm now gonna move from the surgical aspect to how the endocrinologist manages patients right after surgery. So what goes through our minds as endocrinologists is, is what is the function of the gland after surgery? So we look for, or we, or we are concerned about the presence of hypo, that means low, hypopituitarism, low pituitary function. There are two glands that we are concerned about immediately following surgery. 
we look for uh, impact on the adrenal gland, and when the adrenal gland is not functioning, as I said earlier, that's called adrenal insufficiency. And we are looking for any problems with the posterior or back of the pituitary gland, particularly with the hormone ADH, because when that's low, we have diabetes insipidus. Just recollect, diabetes essentially means urinating a lot and drinking a lot. Diabetes mellitus is sugar diabetes. That's not what we're discussing here. It's diabetes insipidus, which means excessive urination because the pituitary gland is not producing the hormone ADH. The other hormones, including growth hormone, testosterone and estrogen, and thyroid, are not critical at this point. They are less urgent, and we'll get back to that in a minute. So, and the other point of this is, is we want to assess whether surgery has been successful at reducing the hormones in those patients who have functioning tumors. We'll come back to that. Now, in terms of the metabolic effects of surgery, there are three phases where this occurs, and they last about 12 days in total. It's called a triphasic or three-phase pattern after surgery. Patients are at risk for diabetes insipidus in the first days after surgery when the, when the pituitary gland is not producing ADH. So patients may have excessive fluid uh, thirst and fluid output, that's urination. This can be followed by phase two, where we have what's called SIDH, which means syndrome of inappropriate or high levels of ADH. And when this happens, patients get very low levels of sodium called hyponatremia. The third phase is back to diabetes insipidus again. Patients may have none of these, one of these, two or three of these. Uh, so we look for this pattern following surgery. And again, the total of this effect somewhere between 12 and 14 days, and after that, the risk is low that something new will happen. For diabetes insipidus, if that happens, we treat them with what's called DDAVP, or desmopressin. Uh, we can, is there either in pill form or in nasal spray form, but after surgery, we usually use pill form. We can also give this as subcutaneous injections. My practice is to use pill form. We use this to treat patients particularly if they lose so much water that the sodium level goes up, that's called hypernatremia, or for comfort. If someone's urinating every hour at night, they're not going to be able to sleep, so we treat them in order to, uh, to maintain the comfort level. In terms of the adrenal function, uh, there are different ways of monitoring this and treating this. There are some institutions that, that give steroids to everybody because the concern is that after surgery, the adrenal gland, because of low ACTH, may not be functioning well and patients may get it ill, and therefore we don't want them to have low levels of cortisol, so they give them steroids and taper over the next few days and then assess where the patient is in terms of needing steroids. That's one option. Another option is one that we use and many other centers use as well, where if the patient has normal adrenal function pre-op, then we don't give any steroids. So we hold all steroids around surgery, and then we measure cortisol every morning. If the level comes back low, less than 5, we treat. Greater than 12, we leave alone. And between 5 and 12, we use clinical judgment. And we have published literature before from our, from our work that shows that if we do this technique, more than half of patients never need to use steroids. So why give it to them if they don't need it? This is safe, patients do well, and it's the practice that we use here. The other function tests, including thyroid uh, and gonadal function and growth hormone, we don't test right away. These take a while to reach a new baseline, and we usually have the patients come back six to eight weeks after surgery, and that's when we do reassessment. We measure thyroid testing again. If it's a woman who is of menstrual age for gonadal function, we'll ask them if they're having menstrual cycles or measure testosterone in the male, and then we assess growth hormone. So all of this is done weeks after the surgery, and that's when we have our new baseline. So the summary of post-operative care, we evaluate the fluid intake and output. Uh, we look for excessive urination, and that's telling us if they have uh, diabetes insipidus. For the adrenal function, if they have normal function before surgery, we don't give any steroids and just measure morning cortisols. If the patient has low levels of adrenal function beforehand, called adrenal insufficiency, then we do cover them with steroids to make sure the patient is safe at surgery. And then all the other hormones, we wait at least six to eight weeks before we retest. That's the, that is the management of 
in general of patients with pituitary tumors. Just my last slides are specific management and assessment of patients who had the functioning tumors. And the first is involving Cushing's disease. So our management of Cushing's disease is the following. Remember, Cushing's disease is a syndrome of too much cortisol. And if the surgeon is successful at removing the tumor, the cortisol levels are going to fall. That's what we want to happen. We want to see low cortisol levels because that tells us the surgery has been successful. So there are different ways that, that these patients are managed at surgery. There are some centers that uh, give steroids to everybody because the concern is if the adrenal function falls, cortisol levels fall, patients may get ill, including low blood pressure or worse. Our protocol is not that is that we hold all steroids, and I'll show you how this works, and we measure cortisol levels every six hours. When we do this, and we measure cortisol levels every six hours, we look for a cortisol less than three, and when that is achieved, we say the patient's in surgical remission. At this, pay, at this point, we start steroids uh, as replacement, which the patients will slowly be tapered over the next months. When we've done this technique, we have found it very safe. Patients do not get ill. They do not get sick for sure. So we find this to be a safe technique. And we will know, therefore, within a couple of days whether the surgery has been successful. Otherwise, if patients are given steroids, we may not know for a week or two if remission has been achieved. Another type of functioning tumor is called acromegaly. And in this setting, patients have a pituitary tumor making too much growth hormone. In the management of these patients, there's a couple of different particularities. The first is that patients with acromegaly are swollen. Growth hormone makes patients have excess water. And when that happens, after successful surgery, they will start urinating a lot. They're getting rid of and mobilizing the fluid that's in their skin and other organs. When this happens, people may think, oh my gosh, I must have diabetes insipidus because I'm peeing a lot, like other patients with pituitary tumors. And sometimes, and honestly, it's tricky to manage these patients, because the question is, is the urine output the increase due to acromegaly remission or is it due to diabetes insipidus? And sometimes it takes a little bit of discussion and management to figure out if that's the case. We also measure growth hormone levels right after surgery. If levels are low, that suggests a surgery has been successful. And then we measure IGF-1 somewhere up to three months after surgery, and we look for a normal IGF-1 level. If that level is now normal, that suggests the acromegaly is in remission. And the last type of pituitary tumor in terms of management after surgery is a prolactinoma. And here what we do is we simply measure prolactin after surgery to see if the level has come down. We can measure that as soon as the morning after surgery, looking for now a normal value. I want to thank you for your time, and I open up the floor to questions for both Dr. Fernandez Miranda and myself. And again, we both thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Hello, thank you so much. That was fascinating. It's uh, great to have both of you on and get to hear from both sides how each uh, specialty handles a surgery. Um, I do not see any questions, and I don't know if it's because you guys covered everything so well or if it's because I'm not getting them. Our um, connection here seems to be having issues. Uh, we were able to hear everything, um, but there were a couple of little delays, but not too serious. So um, if anybody has any questions, you can type them in or also type in to let me know if I can actually see them. So... Um, Ah, okay. There is a question. Uh, Dr. Katznasana, I have diabetes insipidus. I also replace salt from hyponatremia. Why would that be? Usually, so the question has to do with management of diabetes insipidus. And usually, as far in my experience, someone has either hyponatremia or diabetes insipidus. They don't get both. Uh, I do not see a reason why someone would be receiving both salt tablets and receiving DDAVP for diabetes insipidus. In fact, they would seem to counter each other. What we tell people with diabetes insipidus is important in their management to watch the fluid intake. Use salt as they normally would uh, and drink to thirst. That's very important. You drink to thirst is once someone drinks too much then uh, and they're receiving 
DDAVP, they may to get a low sodium level. So you have to drink to whatever they're usually drinking. We tell patients to have the measurements of body weights. We use that. If the weight increases, even over a couple of days, that may presume that there is too much fluid and the person is holding on to too much fluid, and then we may need to reduce the DDAVP dose they can pee it out. But the specific answer to this question is I cannot understand a scenario where that would be, and I would speak with the treating endocrinologist to see if it's necessary to maintain the salt tablets. In my experience, salt tablets are not very helpful, and they may cause nausea, they're not tolerated very well, and they really don't help much in the management. Okay, thank you. Uh, new studies show oxytocin is beneficial for more than just uterus and nursing. What are your thoughts on that? So the question is about oxytocin. It's an interesting one. Oxytocin traditionally has been thought of as the hormone that helps, uh, is, is critical, or, or mostly critical, for labor and delivery because it helps with uterine contractions. But there's been some question that, you, that oxytocin may have some psychological effects. In the lay press, it's called the love hormone because it is a hormone that will increase uh, during sexual activity or even after just a hug. So I'm, I'm a big supporter of hugs. Uh, it, it has been thought to be involved in addiction behavior. Uh, so there's all these kind of psychological interpersonal roles that oxytocin may play a role. In patients who have low pituitary function, uh, it has been found to have, and this is largely from research being done in Boston, uh, of having a role in caloric intake. So maybe there is a role for oxytocin in, in the patients who have certain types of pituitary disease associated with excess weight. The question here today, right now, is whether oxytocin may play a behavioral role in patients who have uh, low pituitary function. And it's possible. I've seen a number of patients who have taken oxytocin, usually through a nasal route, it comes as a nasal spray, that may make people feel uh, uh, they have better social adaptation, better interpersonal skills. I could tell you there's a number of centers, including our own, who are looking at this to get a better sense of what the real benefit is, what the involvement is of oxytocin in interpersonal behavior following uh, pituitary surgery, the resulting in low pituitary function. So I can't comment on it. The FDA certainly has not reviewed this, so it's not FDA approved for this purpose, but there's a number of us who are looking further into this to see if there is a role or we should be considering oxytocin replacement after pituitary surgery in order to improve kind of some of the behavioral issues that people notice after these surgeries. But again, I want to emphasize that it's not every time type of, that not every patient with pituitary surgery is going to have this. It's the patients who really do have low pituitary function, particularly involving the uh, posterior gland where oxytocin is produced. Great, thank you. Um, I have Cushing's disease, but they did not see a tumor on my MRI. Can you talk about the approach to surgery when the tumor isn't pre-identified? So, uh, yeah, that is a great question. Uh, one of the challenges we face uh, as surgeons and so the first thing I would do is to make sure that the pituitary MRI was properly done uh, with all the sequences. There are some newer sequences that might increase the chance of finding a pituitary tumor, a microadenoma. Uh, if that's been done and nothing has been found, then the approach, uh, surgical approach when there is no tumor visualized in the MRI is what I like to do is I you know, and I had the, you know, privilege of working one year uh, on, uh, with Dr. Oldfield at UVA, who was a real master on, on uh, microadenomas for Cushing's disease. And uh, the, the approach basically is you need to do a wide exposure and then open the dura widely from corner to corner so you can inspect the surface of the pituitary gland really well. The front, the bottom, and the sides, even the top. The top you need to be careful not to get a CSF leak, but even the sides, you separate from the cavernous sinus wall and you see the surface of the pituitary gland. Because sometimes you can see an abnormality, uh, something that is more prominent, bulging through the surface of the pituitary gland that tells you that the tumor is in that area. Now, if you don't see anything in that area, then you start doing longitudinal cuts, usually two or three on each side. Uh, these longitudinal cuts are done so you can explore from anterior to posterior through the pituitary tissue. And you do them first on one side, then on the other side, and sometimes doing these longitudinal cuts, you find tumor as you go through the normal pituitary tissue. When uh, um, 
tumor is found, then you need to start trying to surround the tumor and see if there is a capsule you can follow, and then that's a success. But if you still don't find any tumor after having done exploration of the pituitary gland, as we call it, then the next step is to remove three quarters approximately of the pituitary gland. So we would remove, you know, a quarter on the right side, a quarter on the left side, and then the bottom of the pituitary gland, and you leave the central core of the pituitary gland, protects the posterior gland, and you leave a, a, a nice, uh, you know, central portion of the pituitary. With this approach, and I learned this from Dr. Oldfield, uh, you know, the success rate is about 70, 75% of patients would get um, complete remission after the operation, and about 25% would, would have pituitary dysfunction after the operation. So the results are not as bare, as good as, sorry, as if you were uh, doing a selective removal of the tumor, but it still is the next step if you cannot find a tumor. Hope that answers your questions. Thank you. Um, I am panhypopituitary and have been replacing GH for 20 years, panhypopituitary for 50 years. My feet and hands are growing. My teeth have moved. My IGF-1 is mid-range. I became panhypopituitary at 18 and was GHD for 30 years. Do you see acromegaly with PHP patients replacing GH and keeping their IGF-1 mid-range? The goal of growth hormone therapy is to provide a replacement strategy and never to over-replace and essentially cause acromegaly. Once somebody has reached adult size and their uh, what's called epiphyseal or the bone plates and the long bones have fused, the bones can't grow any longer. Uh, so once, once someone's reached adult height, they stop growing. If growth hormone levels are too high, such as from overdosing, people can get excess fluid on board. Like I was telling earlier, growth hormone causes fluid retention. So if the dose is excessive, somebody may notice uh, that they are getting more swollen, and that may look like larger hands or feet, but the bones don't get longer. Uh, Probably in someone like this, where even if we, we shoot for levels of IGF-1 that are mid-normal, we try not to get any higher than that. If that's what levels are, someone may consider just holding the dose for a month or two and just seeing if there's any kind of excessive urination that may lead to losing some of the fluids and hence the hands or feet may be getting a little smaller. It may be worth doing if someone's concerned about side effects. Uh, when we think about growth hormone replacement, we think about long-term use. There's no end point in effect and we continue it largely because people notice if they stay on it or I should say differently if they go off it that they notice the loss of some of the benefits. That can include more fatigue. It may include some changes in cognitive function such as more difficulty with calculation ability or short-term recall, memory recall. So patients generally like to stay on it. They also notice that when on it they have better muscle mass and lose some of their fat components which is also impacted by growth hormone. Uh, so if this person's concerned about the replacement, it's probably worth stopping it for a short time and working with their endocrinologist to see if there's any changes in these findings. Uh, over the Because if there are, people will notice within a month or two that the, there will be less fluid on board and maybe their hands or feet will be a little less swollen. But our goal is to maintain replacement doses, not to overshoot. Okay, thank you. What is the percentage of pituitary tumors that reoccur? The question is, what is the percentage of pituitary tumors that recur? Yes. So, um, well, this varies uh, among centers and surgeons and experience. Um, usually, I refer about 5% recurrence rate over a period of 10 years, or 5 to 10% in a period of 10 years, meaning uh, it, it is 1% per year, 10% at the end of 10 years. So it's actually quite low. But of course, it depends on, on your resection rates to start with, and this varies among pituitary surgeons. You know, some pituitary surgeons are more conservative, and even worse, there are some surgeons that are not pituitary surgeons, they are they're just neurosurgeons that they like to do pituitary surgeons every once in a while, and they do a few cases a year, and then the results are, you know, necessarily worse, and the resection rates are worse, and in those cases, then the re recurrent rate is, is, is gonna be much higher necessarily. 
but in experience P2 three students, the recurrence rate is about five ten percent in ten years. Okay, thank you. Um, if someone with a prolactinoma who is losing pituitary function has changes in peripheral vision, do you recommend evaluation for surgery? Um, well, if, if it's being treated medically, then the changes in peripheral vision should be, ideally should be getting better. If they are not, we would like to see imaging, see if the tumor is shrinking. If the tumor is not shrinking, you may have to increase the doses of the medication. In general, for prolactinomas, to me, it's very important to work with a very reliable, experienced endocrinologist because they can, they can manage the patient properly. You need to make sure that they're doing the medical treatment the right way. If they are and the patient is not responding, then is when you consider doing an operation. Yes, I've done surgery for uh, many prolactinomas. Uh, one of the reasons is because there is uh, no good response to the medication and patient still having visual loss from the mass effect, and then I would recommend an operation. Other indicators are side effects from the medication when they are significant enough, I would also recommend surgery. Okay, thank you. Um, what do you recommend in a case, I know you mentioned something about MRI sequences earlier, um, for the patient who is allergic to the contrast that's used for the MRIs, is there another option at trying to find, and with Cushing's disease, is there another option besides contrast for the MRI to find uh, the tumor, to make it visible? Mm, well, the, the best sequences are, the best way to find a P23 microadenoma is to compare a sequence before and after contrast. Mm. So you wanna have contrast in your MRI. If you're allergic, you can be pre-medicated. There is a protocol for pre-medication that includes steroids, and it's about 13 hours, you get three doses. And with that, the chance of an allergic reaction to the gadolinium, which is the contrast that's used in the MRI, is extremely low. It's still not impossible, but okay. it's very low. Uh, and uh, so it should be pre-medicated and get the MRI with contrast, ideally. Okay, excellent. Um, does GH play a role in the epiphyseal process? If one loses GH at 18, can it stop the process? So growth hormone, as I said earlier, is important for normal bony growth. Once the epiphyseal bone plate, so it's the bone plate at the end of the long bones, close, they, the bones will not get any longer. So what's really critical here is the timing of when the bone, plate, bone plates are closed. And we can find that out easily by just doing hand films. You can do hand films, and you can see for the hand bones and in the wrist bone if the uh, plates are closed. So, you know, someone's bone plates may close when they're 17, 16, 19, 20, so it's, it's, it's highly variable in that time frame when bone plates may close. So, if a patient develops growth hormone deficiency at that age, so the end of high school, for example, early college, the question we have to ask is whether the bone plates are closed, and that's done, and that's found out by performing an x-ray, a hand film. If they're closed, then we would discuss with the patient about the benefits of growth hormone replacement. If the bone plates are open, then the conversation is whether there may be room for growth and whether that's something that is desired by that individual. Okay. So that's basically the approach. All right. Um, what types of image diagnostic tools does Stanford Pituitary Center have, such as a T3 MRI? So we have um, the, uh, yeah, of course, we have several 3T MRIs, and uh, we used a uh, very experienced team of neuro uh, radiologists, which is actually very important because they are the experts in looking at this imaging. Uh, we have a special, a special uh, protocol for Cousin's uh, disease uh, that consists of one millimeter cuts, both axial, coronal, and sagittal, with and without contrast, so you can compare the sequences, and we recently added a uh, flare fine cut sequence, and all this is very specific, but it's a type of sequence that if you wait until the contrast uh, has been, um, uh, is being cleared by the pituitary gland, you are sometimes can visualize tumors you cannot visualize with the normal contrast sequences. So it's a very complete, very complete protocol. It's a long MRI for patients, 
that is you, you, it can make a difference. Excellent, thank you. Uh, looks like that concludes the questions. Excellent questions, everybody, and excellent answers. Uh, we really appreciate you both taking the time to do this presentation for us, and it has been fascinating to have both of you with us to answer questions and the presentation itself. Um, again, we appreciate you taking the time and everyone for joining us. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. If we did not get to answer your questions, which I think we have to answer them all, uh, we can answer them by email. If you missed any part of this webinar or if you'd like to share it with a family member or a friend, it will be available on our website, www.pituitary.org, after it's edited. There'll be a brief survey after the webinar. Please fill it out to help us provide you with the information you need. Thank you all again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.